Good afternoon. My name is Drew Redden and I'm the President and CEO of the Oakville Chamber of Commerce. It's my pleasure to open today's event, Let's Talk Healthy Minds and Resiliency. We are so fortunate to have Lena DeMarco from Bell as an engaged and supportive member of our chamber. Lena leads the community affairs efforts for Bell and we thank her for bringing this opportunity to our membership. Before Lena joins us on screen and introduces our speaker, I wanted to give a brief overview of today's event. Today, we are joined by Dr. Lazar, who will deliver a short presentation, followed by a moderated discussion with our Chamber Board Director, Michelle Sparling. For those of you who signed up and are watching on Zoom, please submit your questions through the presentation, and Michelle will do her best to ensure the topics and themes are addressed throughout the conversation. I also want to thank all of you who have tuned in across our various social platforms. Thank you to our YPEG committee, who every year ensures this conversation is one that is brought to our chamber community. On that note, I'm pleased to welcome Lena DeMarco on screen and thank her once again for her support and all that Bell does to support mental health initiatives across the country. Thank you, Drew, and hello, everyone. As Drew mentioned, I am the Regional Director of Bell Community Affairs and I support the Bell Let's Talk campaign. On behalf of all my colleagues at Bell, let me say what a pleasure it is to join you today and how proud we are to support the Oakville Chamber and this virtual event. Today, in what is becoming a familiar format, rather than have the actual event live in person, we are gonna be treated to what promises to be an enlightening virtual event. And thank you to Dr. Lazar in taking time out of your busy schedule during these uncertain times. Bell's own operating principles in response to COVID-19 has been to keep Canadians connected and informed, prioritize the health and safety of the public, and support the team at Bell and our customers and communities. Before we begin, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank you for participating on Bell Let's Talk Day. On January the 28th, Canadians and people around the world took the biggest mental health conversation to new heights. Millions of messages of support for mental health were spoken, texted, tweeted, and written. We saw some truly inspiring messages on social media. When it comes to mental health, now more than ever, every action counts. Once again, thank you to all who participated. We know that talking about mental health isn't a cure, but it is making a difference. Also, as part of our Bell Let's Talk Mental Health Initiative, I want to bring forward that the 2021 Bell Let's Talk Community Fund is now open. Applications can be submitted until March the 15th on our Bell Let's Talk website. The Community Fund provides annual donations of up to $25,000 to charitable organizations to fund mental health services and support in communities across Canada. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Noah Lazar. Dr. Lazar offers assessment and cognitive behavioral therapy for a wide range of difficulties, including depression and anxiety. He is certified by the Canadian Association of Cognitive Behavioral Therapies, CACBT, in the provision of CBT and is adjunct lecturer with the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto, where he teaches the CBT seminar for the second year psychiatrist residents. Dr. Lazar completed his PhD in clinical psychology at Western University and worked in numerous inpatient and outpatient psychiatric clinics before beginning work full-time in private practice and co-founding the Downtown Psychology Clinic in 2019. You can find Dr. Lazar's full bio on the Oakville Chamber of Commerce website. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Noah Lazar. Thank you so much, Lena, for that lovely introduction. And thank you for, uh, for participating and putting this together. I'm really glad to, to speak with everyone today. Um, and I'm just going to share the presentation with everybody. Um, 
the presentation really, it, it's just to go through a few potential tips, in particular, you know, dealing with a lot of the challenges that people have been dealing with over the course of the pandemic. Um, we thought it might be helpful to put together just a few things just to consider if you are finding that you are struggling with, with mental health. So I'll, I'll dive right into it because I want to save uh, lots of time for questions. Um, so first of all, one of the things that we know throughout the pandemic um, is that it's been a challenging time for mental health. And I find especially since we've gotten into the winter where the days are a little bit shorter sometimes, it's cold outside, you can't go for walks, you can't see friends outside. It's been a little bit more challenging. Um, it's common for people to experience increased symptoms of depression or anxiety during this time. Um, that can include things like, you know, just generalized low mood. Sometimes when people are feeling down or they're feeling anxious, you might notice increased irritability, um, increased worry. Uh, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. People sometimes have trouble sleeping, um, and that's often due to the, the, the low mood or the anxiety. People have trouble concentrating and certainly we've heard the term of, of zoom fatigue that's been setting in but also when people are worrying about things or when people are feeling down it's very hard to focus on on what you're doing because there's sort of a, a running narrative in the back of your mind of other things um, people also may find they have increased muscle tension and you know in part that's because we're sitting in front of a, a screen all the time but also just when people are anxious it's not uncommon for their muscles to tense up so people may notice increased headaches people may notice jaw pain people may notice back pain um, and particularly when they feel more more stressed out or more anxious one of the, the things that I often hear from people is, well, I don't want to be anxious or, or I don't want to have these emotions or, you know, I used to be able to get through this meeting and, and focus perfectly well and now I'm finding it harder or my productivity is down and I can't quite do things in the way that I used to. And one of the things that I think can be really helpful is recognizing that these actually are very difficult times. And so it's normal to have anxiety, it's normal to have low mood. People may be angry about things that they've missed out on or certain restrictions that are in place. People may have a lot of grief, perhaps because they've lost somebody, perhaps because they've had to give up certain things as a result of, of where we're at. And so um, what I try to tell people that it's, it's important to not beat yourself up for having emotions that are perfectly reasonable you want to sort of allow for them to be present on the one hand, but on the other hand, you want to try not to dwell on them. The motions themselves are meaningful. If you're anxious, it's probably there's a reason why you're anxious. If you're feeling down, there's probably a reason that you're feeling down. But we also don't want to overly focus on them. And instead, sometimes it's about recognizing like, yeah, I feel anxious today. Yep, this is a hard day. Yep, my productivity is down. And instead of getting into the nitty gritty, how do I refocus on things that are more consistent with my priorities and my values? So, you know, just because you're having a down day, it doesn't mean you can't do things that are still important to you. So although you may not feel like you're getting up and cooking, if that's something you enjoy doing, that could be a great way to take your mind off of the, the anxiety or, or the low mood or the thoughts that are, that are going on. Um, and that can kind of help you out of that that sort of headspace. One of the things that's also happened and sort of over the course of, of the times that we've been in, it, it's continued to happen sort of where our routines keep getting disrupted. So, you know, if you think about when you started at work, you had a certain routine, you got up at a certain time, you got ready, you had your commute, you had your coffee breaks with people, you had your lunch breaks with people, maybe you saw people after work, you commuted home, you had a, a certain structure that, that came with the day. And there were certain boundaries that you also had between work and home because, you know, perhaps, you know, you'd finish off your emails on the commute home and then, you know, you would have time with your family when you got home. Now those routines have been disrupted. And so when we were all asked to work from home, 
you know, people really had to change up pretty much everything that they were used to about their day. Then things opened up again and we were asked to, you know, we changed those up again. And then we went back into lockdown and those changed again. We're not always so great with change. Um, we, we tend to like a certain level of certainty and a certain level of routine. Um, and what people have found, and I think people are adjusting to it a little bit more as time has gone on, but when you're working from home, there's certainly a lot more isolation that's occurring. There's a lot more distractions. You know, I hear stories all the time of parents who are managing online learning with their kids while at the same time trying to have a meeting. Um, and people have a less than ideal workspace. I think a lot of people find themselves working at their dining room table, working at their couch. And that sort of blends, you know, it's, it's where I eat, it's where I work, it's where I watch TV. You don't get that same separation that you used to. Um, so one of the things that can be helpful is trying to set some level of routine or some level of separation between work and, and your personal time. So having a similar, you know, wake up time and bedtime, almost getting ready as if you were starting your day. So sometimes I'll suggest to people, you know, if you had a morning routine where, you know, you'd have a shower, you'd brush your teeth, you'd get ready. Even if you're on Zoom all day, do all those things, you know, wear dress clothes as though you were going to work, get yourself ready. And similarly, unwind in the same way at the end of the day. Putting in exercise and breaks is really important. Um, exercise can often be a very helpful strategy when trying to deal with anxiety and depression. Um, and, you know, in the past, you know, you might have had a lunch break, you might have had, you know, time where you specifically took breaks to go for coffee with colleagues or something to that effect. And when you're on Zoom or when you're at home, sometimes we just work right through them. Sometimes we don't bother taking a lunch. We just eat at our desk or having those breaks can really help prevent people from getting overwhelmed. And trying to schedule in time with friends because of the lack of social contact that you might get in the workplace, but also in general, now that we are, you know, being asked to stay home or we're in the red zone or so on, and, and we're not supposed to be seeing people and mixing households and so on, it can actually be those, those more natural moments of when you would talk to somebody and say like, hey, what are you up to? Or, hey, do you want to grab a bite to eat? Those can be a little harder and less natural to do when you have to sort of do it on Zoom and make more of a conscious effort to try and see people. And so it's important to really schedule those in because without the schedule, sometimes people just you know, oh, I'll do that tomorrow, I'll do that the next day, and then ultimately a week has gone by and you haven't necessarily spoken to anyone. So scheduling it in gives it a bit of a higher probability often that you will end up being able to see someone. It's also important to set reasonable limits. As we were sort of saying, you know, when you are working from home, it, it, everything kind of blends. Your home life, your work life, all sort of seems to, to run into one. And so it's useful to set up some limits to kind of decide when am I online, when am I offline? You know, whether, you know, it's about taking your computer, turning it off, putting it away so you can't sort of see it anymore, whether it's about physically removing yourself from the office. So, you know, I, I often find it helpful if, if you can have a workspace that's very separate from your personal living space, even if that means that you have put yourself in a corner of the living room, but you can't see the rest of your living space so that you're not kind of seeing your couch all day or seeing your dining room all day or seeing where you relax all day. And then also having that blending in with, oh, there's my computer right there. There's a couple things I didn't finish. So giving yourself that space physically can also be very, very helpful. One of the other things that we know is that what we do has a huge effect on our mood. And when we're, we're sort of feeling down in particular, um, having or scheduling in activities or making sure that we get around to activities that confer a sense of mastery or achievement or enjoyment is really important. Um, a lot of times, you know, we may find that you were feeling kind of down, we don't have a lot of energy right now, or we're caught up in our thoughts and thinking about other things. And it's useful 
to try and set activities that you plan to do throughout the day that you know are going to hopefully make you feel better. Um, when we're looking at cognitive behavioral therapy, behavioral activation is one of the first things that we often try to do with people who are feeling very down because the hope is if you're feeling at like a two out of ten every day, if we can give you a few moments where you're even a five out of ten, Overall, that just improves your week and that just improves your day. And it's good to strike a balance between work and personal time. You don't want to suddenly overemphasize, well, I'm going to do a whole bunch of extra work projects because then you may burn out and become overwhelmed. So balancing achievement at work with personal tasks at home can actually really try to elevate that mood ultimately. Um, there we go. So things that you enjoy typically are good as a good place to start things that you always wanted to do you know it, it may be a good opportunity to try and and incorporate some of those things you don't also you just want to be careful you don't shift it too far into setting too many expectations for yourself. You know, I, I think especially early on in the pandemic, people were posting photos of baking sourdough breads and learning a new language and, and re-roofing the roof and repainting their, their bedroom and so on. And I think it, it sometimes can set an expectation that, oh, I should be using my time so productively. Like, why haven't I baked any bread yet? And I think Number one, you don't have to bake a bread. Um, you don't have to do any of this stuff, really. It, it's really about what's important to you and, and trying not to overwhelm yourself or, or set too many things to do because then you'll run out of time to do them. Um, breaking down the tasks into more manageable ones, um, especially when people are feeling already fairly stressed out or their, their mood is low, Saying, you know, I'm going to reorganize all of my kitchen cabinets can actually feel very daunting all of a sudden. And it, it sort of pushes you away from maybe wanting to do the task. But breaking some of those things down into, well, you know what, let me clean out the part that's under the sink. And that's all I'm going to do today. And it's great because it makes you feel accomplished on the one hand that you, you got something done, but it's not overwhelming to the extent that, you know, it feels like there's, there's so much left to do because you've got that scheduled for tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And really the success isn't showing up. Even if, you know, you don't get as much done as you expect, even if it wasn't as enjoyable as you expected it to be, the important thing is that you tried it and that you, you tried to do something that, that was hopefully going to be good for you. Another thing, you know, when they tell us about physical distancing, or we hear the term social distancing all the time, and some of the mental health effects that come from being separated, you know, we, we are generally very social. Um, humans like interaction, and we like to be able to talk to people and share experiences and so on. So it, it can be very difficult when we're being asked to stay away from one another. And especially, I think, during the winter months, that's been even more difficult because whereas people could go for walks, people might be able to sit on the porch and have a conversation with, with friends. You know, now, you know, up until recently, it'd been, you know, minus 20 out. And so it, it was difficult to sometimes engage in those activities. It doesn't mean you can't maintain social connections. So phone calls, video calls, people are doing virtual dinner parties or lunch meetings, virtual office meetings. I will say they don't always feel the same as they did when you were sitting with somebody in person, because really the, the dynamics are a little different. If you think about, let's say, going for dinner in person with a friend, you're sitting here they're sitting here, you're ordering, you're having time to drink, you know, your drink, you're having time to eat, maybe you're checking your text messages a little bit. Whereas when you're on one-on-one -on -one with Zoom, there tends to be a little bit more of an attention that, you know, you're there, I'm here, and we're supposed to be having this conversation. And a lot of people have told me it feels a little bit more unnatural, or they find it hard. You know, they could get through a two hour dinner, no problem, but they're finding they're running out of stuff to say after half an hour with people. That's okay. That's probably just par for the course, given the circumstances. And just doing some adjustments. Instead of doing a full dinner, maybe you just do a coffee with somebody and you keep it to about half an hour. Um, 
you know, it, it's just a matter of getting used to it. And I find once people get used to that format, it actually makes it a lot easier down the road. Um, a lot of people are also talking about worry uh, more recently. And worry comes often from uncertainty. Sometimes I, I, I conceptualize worry almost as a fear of uncertainty. And it's, it's in the not knowing where all of a sudden there's a trigger that will set things off and it can lead to a chain of what if. What if this happens? And then what if this happens? And they tend to be hypothetical questions. There's no evidence necessarily this is about to happen. But because we can't be certain in a way of ruling it out absolutely, that fact that it could happen, it's almost in a sense, we react to the possibility of an event occurring rather than the probability of an event occurring. And the fact that it could happen can sometimes send us down that worry path. Sometimes when we have those what if questions, you know, it can be useful to try and answer them. So if you suddenly think, you know, well, what if I lose my job? Okay, well, I'll apply for new ones and, you know, I have a great resume and, and I can, I'm sure I'll get one, you know, within the next few months. If you can sort of do that, hopefully that would actually alleviate the worry. More often than not, I find it becomes, you know, what if I lose my job? And then what if I can't find one? And then what if, you know, we end up losing our house? And then what if, you know, we're homeless? And, and it sort of tends to go to that worst case scenario. One way to think about those moments is if it is a potential problem, actually, let's talk about if it's a current problem first. If it's a current problem, you know, so something in front of you, you have control over it and you have enough information to be able to do something about it, then you can problem solve. So if you were to say, you know, what if I lose, you know, what if, you know, they're announcing layoffs, what if I'm going to lose my job? There are certain things you could problem solve and control. You could start to prepare your resume, you could start to network with friends, you could start to, you know, see, put out feelers for any opportunities, those things you have control over and you can problem solve. Whether or not you might lose your job, on the other hand, that is a potential problem. We don't know if you will. But that's where people can get caught worrying all night long, will this happen? Won't this happen? I don't know. In those moments, you're often better off to distract yourself and refocus because you could think about that for an hour, you could think about that for a day, you're probably not going to be much closer to an answer because the reality is you don't have enough information to resolve this issue. So trying to distract when it's a potential problem and trying to problem solve when it's a current problem can often give you some strategies in terms of at least getting your, your mind away from the anxiety. We also have a strategy in CBT that we call cognitive restructuring. And the, the premise in, in, in cognitive behavioral therapy is that how we feel in any given moment is not necessarily determined by the event that has just happened. It's often determined by the thoughts that we have or the interpretations that we make in that moment. So just as an example, if I'm walking down the street and I see a friend of mine across the street walking the other way, and you know, I wave to my friend and you know, say, hey, Bob, hey, how you doing? And Bob doesn't acknowledge me and just keeps walking. One thought I could have is Bob is upset with me. Bob doesn't want to be my friend anymore. And that might make me feel very anxious or that might make me feel very sad. On the other hand, I could have the interpretation or the thought Bob probably didn't see me, in which case I would feel fairly neutral. Those thoughts go through our mind fairly quickly. We're often not aware of them. What we are aware of is the emotion. So I might wave and wave and wave and Bob walks past me and then I'll notice that my anxiety kicks in. And so what we want to try to understand is what went through my head in that moment? How did I, what is it about what just happened that made me feel anxious? But also recognizing that just because you think it, it doesn't mean it's true. There are multiple reasons why Bob may not have waved at me. 
And we want to assess how accurate or how probable is the interpretation that I just thought of in the moment. So another example is a boss just, your boss just compliments you on a recent report. How do you react? Most people will tell me that they're gonna be happy because the interpretation or the thought is, I did a great job. Some people will feel, maybe they'll have the thought, I think my boss was being sarcastic. You know, they were kind of intending it as like, oh, I didn't think you'd do a good job, but hey, good job. And in those cases, they might be angry. And some people will say to me, you know, well, now that I know that my boss has complimented me, I know they're, they're watching what I do. So next time, you know, there's gonna be higher expectations of me. And if I make a mistake, I'm gonna get fired. And I've heard, you know, in the people that I've talked to, all three reactions, people who get very happy from a compliment, people who get very angry from a compliment, and people who get very anxious from a compliment. It could be the same compliment. The idea is it's how you think about the compliment that determines how you feel about it. So one way just to, to sort of think about how to, to, you know, get that thought, an easy question is what just went through my mind in this moment? What's the worst that can happen? What is that, what am I afraid of? What does that mean to me? I often like the question, what is it about this compliment? that made me feel a certain way because I can imagine a scenario where, you know, I'm feeling very angry about this compliment, but I could imagine somebody else feeling pretty happy about getting a compliment. How am I thinking about this differently? And the general idea that we wanna do is to really think about is our thought the most accurate way or the most probable way of perceiving what we're doing in this moment? Or, or, or how is it the best way to interpret what just happened? And I don't know if anybody ever watches those court TV shows like Judge Judy or things like that. It's one of my favorites. So I, I often reference it. But if you think about it, typical Judge Judy case, $500 has exchanged hands. One person says it's a gift. One person says it's a loan. You could almost think about that they have two different thoughts about what that exchange of money was. The rest of the episode is about generating evidence. How do I know, how would I prove that it was a gift? How would I prove that it was a loan? And based on that evidence, you come to a conclusion, you know, it, it, was this a gift or was this a loan? I can do the same with Bob. What evidence do I have that Bob is angry with me? And we want concrete evidence, not just, well, I think it possibly could be. You know, did we have a fight? You know, did I see Bob look at me and then look away? Was there, you know, did Bob behave strangely the last time I saw him? What would be the evidence that doesn't support it? Well, Bob was on the other side of the street. It was a busy street. It was four lanes. It was fairly far away. It was noisy out. I was trying to yell. Bob usually wears headphones when he's walking. So the chance probably didn't even hear me. And he was staring down. So he was looking at his phone. He never had a chance to see me. All that would support the idea that Bob just didn't see me. It had nothing to do with Bob being angry with me. So when we have these moments of anxiety and depression, if we can figure out what our thought is, we can challenge it to see if it's accurate. And Another way of kind of doing that, a similar way with worry, because sometimes like, you know, what if I lose my job? It's sometimes hard to say like, yes, 100%, no 100%. That's the whole thing with the uncertainty is using probability reestimation. We often tend to overestimate the probability of the worst case scenario occurring. So if I ask somebody, you know, someone says, I'm going on a plane and I'm worried it's going to crash. And I say, what chance do you think it's going to crash? 10%. But if we actually look at the data, it's like 0. 0.000 something percent in, in terms of any, the actual probability of a plane crash. So if you can use reliable information and examine the actual probabilities, sometimes you can shrink that because a 10% probability of a plane crash is much more anxiety provoking than a 0.001% chance of a plane crash. 
Um, relaxation strategies. Those are excellent ways of really bringing the physiological reactions down. So if you're feeling a lot of tension in your body, if you're feeling your anxiety very physically, deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, visualization techniques, mindfulness exercises. And you can sort of look a lot of these up on YouTube just to get a sense of what that looks like. But they can be very helpful in reducing the anxiety and reducing the physical tension. With mindfulness in particular, it talks about how to help let thoughts go in the moment as opposed to dwelling on them. So becoming an observer of your thoughts rather than engaging with them. And again, that can be a very helpful uh, strategy, especially when you're caught up in worry. Another important thing, and, and you know, uh, you guys can take a look through all the specific strategies, but sleep is a really important part of ensuring good mental health. When people are tired, um, it, it, it can worsen anxiety, it can worsen depression. There are some simple tasks, you know, they don't work for everybody, but simple things, you know, trying to have a similar bedtime and wake up time is very helpful. Your body works on a 24 hour clock. So the more you make your wake up and your sleep time predictable, the easier it is your body to wind down and, and wind back up. Um, another really important one is that the bedroom should only be for sleep. You don't want to do work in bed. You don't want to read in bed. You don't want to watch TV in bed. All of those things are wakeful exercises. And so your brain starts to learn when I'm in bed, I'm doing this arousing activity rather than a sleeping activity. Um, try to avoid bright lights. They tend to wake you up. Facing your clock away from you. You know, if you're doing the whole, it's 1 a.m., it's 1.05, it's 1.15, that's just going to make you more anxious and it's going to be harder to fall asleep. If you haven't fallen asleep in what you would estimate is about 20 minutes, it's actually not a bad idea to get up. Rather than toss and turn, get up, distract yourself for a few moments, go back to bed. Breaking that cycle, the more anxious and the more frustrated you get, the longer you stay in bed and tossing and turning can actually make it worse. Um, trying to have rituals is also good. It signals to your brain, oh, this is bedtime now. And try to avoid having some stress. Before, right before bed. This is not the time to hit send on that really important career defining email just before you go to sleep. Probably you want to just have a little bit of time to unwind. Um, and obviously avoiding caffeine and alcohol because those can, can ultimately disrupt your sleep. Um, the last point I just want to make is some resources here. If you are struggling, and again, these are just some, some generic tips to try. Sometimes they can be very difficult to implement and everybody has their own unique situation um, where these would apply a little bit differently. So if you feel like you need some help, it's, it's not a bad idea to reach out. Right now, there are programs out there that you can access um, internet-based cognitive behavioral therapy for free um, through the Ontario government, for example. Um, there are other resources, Kids Help Phone, Crisis Lines, you know, if you have a, an EAP or health insurance, accessing the assistance of a, of a psychologist. It, it's, it's a great opportunity if you are struggling to help get tools that are a little bit more tailored to your specific situation and, and, and hopefully make you feel a lot better. So great. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Lazare. That was fantastic. There's some really great information that you've managed to, you know, uh, some of us probably had in our toolboxes, but it's reminding us that those tools are there. And on the other side, it's also about, you know, adding a few more into that to be able to help with our own overall mental health and well-being. Um, so we'll really appreciate that feedback. So a few questions that we do have. Um, one is says, somebody says, I'm not getting things done as much as I used to. How can I be more productive? Well, that's a, that's a great question. I hear that a lot. And I think it, it comes down to two things. One is the scheduling. Having the schedule, knowing what you're supposed to do, putting in the right breaks, keeping that work-life balance can sometimes increase productivity. But also, I think it's one of those times where people are experiencing Zoom fatigue, people are struggling with anxiety. It Productivity may be decreased a bit. So it's important to set realistic expectations. And that comes back to that idea of the self-compassion that, you know, maybe it's okay to be a little bit less productive right now. If, if, you, if you did 10 reports before and you're doing nine, it's probably okay. Um, you know, and, and you'll get back to 10 when, when we get back to, to our more usual 
circumstances. Thank you for that. Um, another question we have is there, there was a comment on your, um, when you talked about trying to deal with your thoughts. And in this case, you know, the thoughts are overwhelming and the ability to stop and pause and reflect, you know, in the moment is really, really hard to do when we're looking at what's the likelihood of the probabilities. So when somebody finds themselves in that situation, what's the best way to approach that? Because they're already feeling so overwhelmed. Or as I always used to say, it's like the continuous loop is happening in your head. So how do I stop that loop? So it can be tough to stop because, you know, especially with worry, it's, it's just that chain of, you know, what if this or what if that or thinking about the next idea that comes into your mind. And, and often it feels like we haven't even dealt with the first thought before we're, our mind is on to the next thought. I actually find writing them down can be helpful. Not so much as maybe like a journal where that could, you know, suddenly you have 10 pages and that's also feeling kind of overwhelming, but even just writing out point form, like here's my worry. And then this was my next thought. And this was my next thought at a later time when you're maybe feeling a bit less overwhelmed, you can come back to it. And that's a great opportunity to do the challenging because um, the challenging does take practice. It's kind of like driving a car. You know, at first you're, you're kind of uncertain with how to use it. And, you know, it's not as, as intuitive as you might think, but with a lot of practice, you know, you can almost start to, you know, do it in your sleep. And so practicing when you're not overwhelmed is a great opportunity to, to sort of learn the skill, but also once you have a, a sort of challenge to those thoughts, next time you have it, you can easily reflect back on your, on sort of your, um, what you've already come up with as a way to counter it in the moment. That's a really good point. And it reminds me that, you know, with the old saying that you never don't learn to use a fire extinguisher when you've got a fire. Actually, that's a great analogy. Yeah, it's a very, very similar. Um, another question that we have is related to try, you talked about you know, that work-life balance. And for some people, they're trying to do that balance, but they've got, as you said, they're working from home. They've got their you know, kids maybe at home doing the virtual school, sometimes they're in school, sometimes they're home. And so their schedule is flexing, but they also have the issue of elder care, you know, where they may have a parent who may be living on their own, but has some challenges or is in long-term care. So there's a lot of pressures in, on people right now and they're feeling very overwhelmed. You know, so any advice or tips for people, you know, to how to really be able to manage that because it is so much and too, almost too much. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think with, with some of those, kind, those circumstances, we find ourselves in a position where there's a lot to manage and there's a lot to juggle. While at the same time, a lot of the resources that perhaps we would have had to assist with managing those things. So, um, it, you know, if, if you were to have, you know, somebody who can come into, let's say, care in the home, but they're not able to come anymore. Or, you know, when your kids were in school, you know, you, you wouldn't have to manage online learning or homework at that time. Or even just having outlets to have that, you know, you know, going, being able to go to the gym easily or seeing friends to unwind from all of that pressure. It, it's, it's, it's very challenging. And I think it, what I would almost recommend is going to the, back to the expectations and the scheduling. You know, it's, it's really about looking at what can I reasonably do and how much time do I have to reasonably do it? And trying to pull in supports where you can. So, you know, there have been people who've been telling me about great groups where parents have gotten together with their kids doing online learning and it's sort of one parent is on duty for a particular period while the other, you know, 10 of them are off doing their work and then somebody substitutes in or trying to come up with those kind of creative ideas to alleviate some of the burden. But I will say in, in those moments, it can be very, very difficult because there's, there's a lot and sometimes it's hard to find alternative strategies. And I think it's, it, it's doing the best you can to set the expectations, have that self-compassion and try to schedule yourself so you're not overwhelmed. Yeah. And, th and those are really good points because you're right with a lot of people, um, you know, very much this last year for some people, it's been the perfect storm. You know, and because nobody has experienced this before, you know, our lifetime, and to be able to manage all these pieces that we don't know how to manage, you know, becomes a bit of a challenge. You know, and in those cases, it's as you're right, it's to give ourselves permission, you know, to say, you know, good enough, to give ourselves permission to say, you know what, no. I can't do that because unless we do that, we're going to hit that wall. You know, so one of the things that comes up from people is they talk about stress. 
and they talk about the stresses building up on them. Can you talk a little bit about the effects that somebody may see if they are experiencing or feeling stress? Yeah, chronic stress, and I think probably everybody is feeling it to some extent. And, and stress I often use as, as fairly synonymous with anxiety because it's the stress response is it, sort of a, it's a similar response to anxiety response. It's kind of your anxiety response is really when you're detecting some kind of a threat. Your anxiety response kicks in, it's fight or flight. It's trying to protect you in those scenarios. For a lot of people, I think when there is these sort of underlying stressors that are there and they're not really going away. You know, the uncertainty of what will happen with vaccinations, the uncertainty of when the economy will open up further, the uncertainty of, you know, going to a grocery store and what if I, I come close to somebody who has one of these variants. There's always kind of this underlying stress that occurs. And sometimes it, it, it's almost like a that expression we talk about with like a frog in, in boiling water where, it slowly gets dialed up and you almost don't even notice that you're experiencing it. But some of the signs to look out for are things like the muscle tension, feeling exhausted all the time, finding you're having a hard time sleeping or waking up and not getting back to sleep, um, being more irritable with people, uh, you know, one, finding that, you know, you need to just sit by yourself after a day's work and just not talk to anybody because you're so overwhelmed. Those little things, you know, again, they, they can often be fairly hard to notice, but that can be a good example of what to look for. I know for me in particular, and people have joked about this, when I get stressed, I, I tend to carry it in my neck and shoulders. And so I don't even know I'm doing it, but I've had people come up behind me and apparently I'm like this, they'll come up behind me and just pull my shoulders down. And that's almost my cue of like, oh, I think I'm having a stressful day today. And so now that's something I look out for. If I feel like my shoulders are up here, I know I need to implement some strategies to try and relax. Great. Um, a few other questions that we have here. How do you handle panic attacks? Panic attacks. Those are interesting. Um, it depends on why the panic attack is occurring. So sometimes if, if I'm hitting the peak of anxiety over a particular issue. Um, so if let's say I'm, I'm have a lot of social anxiety and I have to give a speech, it could escalate into a panic attack. Some people also have them out of the blue. So in situations where they wouldn't otherwise anticipate having a panic attack. In both cases, one of the important messages is that while anxiety is very uncomfortable, you know, all the symptoms that you have during a panic attack, people think they're having a heart attack, people think they're going to lose control or they're losing their mind. Anxiety is ultimately your fight or flight safety system. Anxiety isn't dangerous. It's not going to hurt you. It's, it's sort of, I liken it to, it's like having a, a really bad bout of nausea. It's really uncomfortable, but we sort of sit through it and wait for it to pass. And then eventually it will. And anxiety will do the same thing. It will escalate, but it can't stay at that peak level forever. If you wait it out, it will come down on its own. Um, and, and that's actually often the best strategy. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable, but it's not gonna hurt you. It's not dangerous and just to wait it out. That's a really good uh, feedback. Thank you for that. Um, another question that we have is what do you see post-pandemic mental health services looking like? How will the system be able to handle the assumed increase of service demand that we're coming out on the other side of the pandemic? You know, I think we're all expecting, um, and I think certainly we've seen it during the pandemic, that there has been a significant increase for, for mental health services. Um, and I'm glad that the, you know, certain you know, organizations have been able to make, you know, certain online programs a little bit more accessible for people um, to, to sort of help them through it. To be honest, I think I always go personally with the idea that mental health is part of health. And so it's something that we need to emphasize as part of, you know, our overall wellness and, and well-being. Um, in terms of how the system sort of changes to accommodate, that's probably a bit above my pay grade, but uh, I, I certainly hope it, 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 this has really shone a light on the need for mental health services and, and the importance of why it's important to, to be able to manage these, these stressors. Because we can see 
what I mean, it's sort of extraordinary circumstances right now, but we can see how it affects people. No, absolutely. I mean, as you, as you write, everybody has mental health, you know, but it's bit that continuum of where they are in terms of, you know, how they, how well they're doing and how they're managing it. Um, yeah. And I mean, in terms of, you know, what happens later on, I think that's an advocacy piece that so many of us are happy to share our voices to help, you know, organizations and people like you to make sure that the services and supports are there for when you have to direct people. Yeah. So we'll, we'll keep working on that one for you. Another question we have is due to the pandemic, social anxiety has increased and um, has been impacted more for people to have anxiousness during interviews. How can we reduce it from going through an interview? Yeah, you know, it's interesting with, with the pandemic, it, I, I find at least initially people who had social anxiety were, were pretty happy with kind of the scenario because you didn't have to be in front of a classroom. You didn't have to sit at a meeting with a whole bunch of people. You could kind of sit there with your camera off and, and sort of be a bit more in the background. What we know when people get anxious, as we said earlier, it's sort of the fight or flight. And when we get anxious, we tend to avoid certain things that make us anxious. And the more we avoid, it, it gives us a level of relief in the short term, but in the long term, the anxiety starts to get worse. And from a, a CBT perspective, one of the best ways of getting over anxiety is to sort of plow right through it. So I think for a lot of people who perhaps were already socially anxious, it's sort of been a forced avoidance because there isn't the opportunity then to interact. There haven't been a lot of social opportunities. And so the exposure that we would have every day has been, has been lacking. And so one of the ways to sort of combat it um, and, and what we would typically do in a social anxiety type of uh, approach is exposure-based work. So this is the moment to start talking to as many people as you can, you know, signing up with Toastmasters and giving some speeches, signing up for an improv class, signing up for all of those moments that put you out in front of people. Because the more you do it, what happens is your anxiety starts here. Second time you do it, it's here, third time, fourth time, fifth time, until it starts to habituate and extinguish. So leading up to the interview, if you know you have one coming, um, practicing role plays with friends, you know, signing up for Toastmasters, like giving yourself a little lead time. Um, sometimes just, you know, and doing some, I think if, if you have an interview suddenly tomorrow and you don't have the time to, to kind of gear up and, and, and kind of wait for that anxiety to come down by doing a few different activities, even just role playing and a lot of practice can really go along with it. Well, that, those are really great tips. Thank you for that. Um, another question we have is, what if instead of feeling stressed, do you feel that you're losing motivation to accomplish anything? Yeah, and I think a lot of people feel that way right now. I hear that quite often that, you know, especially with work, that people just aren't feeling that same drive and that same motivation to get things done. Um, I think it's a couple of things. One, that can sometimes coincide with depression. When we get depressed, we tend to withdraw from activities and, and our motivation just tends to decrease. And so it's possible that, that it could be part of a larger thing that might require sort of a more broader treatment because the idea would be if, if the depression alleviates, the motivation would start to come back. But I, I find sometimes it, it can also be little tricks, like, you know, where people find they're not as motivated because they don't get feedback from their boss as much anymore because, you know, they're not running into them in the hall to say like, oh, that was a great job that you did. And so, you know, they're not hearing from anyone for two weeks or something and they're feeling like, oh, I don't know, am I doing a good job? Am I appreciated or whatnot? Even trying to increase communication, trying to get, if that's the issue, getting feedback more. Sometimes the scheduling can help. Whenever we have like a level of accountability to others, that often does increase the motivation to do something. So if you think about, you know, going to the gym on your own, when we could go to the gym, you know, after a hard day versus knowing that you had to meet a friend, you know, you're more likely to go if you have to meet a friend. So if you can increase the accountability, so either scheduling it in for yourself to say, I'm gonna have it done by this time, or even sometimes telling somebody else like your boss, you know, 
I plan to have this done by here. It lights a little bit of a fire under you. I would say though, just make sure that that is realistic in terms of how you plan it. Otherwise, the anxiety could become overwhelming and then people avoid and then they miss the deadlines and then they feel pretty bad and then they're even less motivated to do it later. So it, it, it's just, if done sort of with a, a realistic lens, it can actually be a useful way to just to give you that little extra boost. Okay. okay, another question we have um, is that we have some this uh, one person says they've noticed that their coworker um, is not themselves anymore. You know, that they seem to be uh, much qu more quieter, uh, more anxious, and they're more worried about them. And they want to know what are the best ways to approach a coworker or even you know, whether it's their boss or an employee to say, you know, what's going on? Yeah, and I mean, that can, that can be a tough one. Um, I think it's, it's challenging because you don't, maybe the person is kind of hoping they're not showing signs and that that could be, you know, problematic for them if they're like, oh, I'm clearly showing it in the workplace. I think if you know them well enough that that wouldn't be an issue. I, I there's no kind of one size fits all because everybody is so different. Some people, need to know that, oh yeah, that person's available if I ever wanted to call them for something. And some people, you know, would need to be reached out to more. And some people don't want to talk about it. And some people do want to talk about it. And so I think asking or even just highlighting, you know, and you don't even have to say, I've noticed you've been more dot, dot, dot. Even just saying, how have you been doing? And if they say, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Maybe you don't want to push it too much further, but if they say, you know, you know, managing as best we can, that does leave a little bit of room to ask, like, so how are you managing? What's been going on? And gauging from them or even asking, like, how can I help support you? And you'll get different answers from different people, but it's a good way to open the door just to figure out what would be most helpful for that individual. Those are really good points. Um, and I think we have time for one other question. One is, I'm really scared to go to the grocery store or anywhere else. And, you know, if I have to, I don't go into people's homes, but if I had to, you know, how do I get deal with that? Because I know that the risk of, you know, getting sick from the pandemic is still very real. Yeah, it definitely is a real risk. Um, what I try to, to help people sort of think about is, doing a little bit of that, I guess, that probability re-estimation. So looking at what is sort of your concern, like the ultimate concern, and what is the, the likely probability of that outcome occurring, and trying to compare that to other things that, because there's risk technically in you know, anything we do, there could always be risk, but we tolerate a lot of it. And, you know, I, I remember speaking to somebody, you know, when we sort of looked at that, that she was afraid of, of getting, going to the grocery store, catching COVID, dying and so on. And we could go on the ministry website, look at the case counts in the area, look at the numbers, look at the, you know, the, the severe outcomes for her demographic. And we could actually come up with a, a reasonable number that she felt was like, yeah, that's probably the probability. I think at the time it was maybe less than 1%. She was also somebody who enjoyed doing like, you know, I forget what it was, but it was something like skydiving or something along those lines. And when I asked her how that compared, she was like, yeah, it's probably more risky to skydive than it is to go to the grocery store. And maybe if I'm okay with this risk, I can be okay with that risk too. But everybody has a different level where they're gonna draw the line of what's too risky. Somebody will say, if it's a 1% chance, you know, that's okay with me. And somebody will say 1% is, far too risky. And it depends on the outcome. I mean, if someone told you, if you get on an airplane, there's a 1% chance that'll crash, I probably wouldn't get on that airplane. If you told me it was a 0 0.00001 chance, I probably would. If you told me it was a 1% chance I'd give, go to the grocery store and die, I probably wouldn't want to go there. If you said, if it was a, you know, it was a 1% chance that you might contract it, but you'd be totally fine, then that would probably change the probability estimate. But everybody draws their own line somewhere. And it can just be a strategy to compare within your own comfort levels where that probability really falls. 
So actually I have two very quick questions. So actually the second one may not be as quick, but I will try to make it quick for you. The first one says, I see so much negative stuff on the news, you know, and it stresses me out. I don't know how to filter through all that I'm seeing. What's the best way for me to look at this and decide what's real and what's not? It is so tough because we are constantly bombarded by news. I mean, anytime you go to a news site, the top banner is often, here are your COVID numbers for today. So what I would say is using reputable news sites is very important because there's a lot of misinformation that's out there, but also chunking and limiting when you're going to access it. So if you find that you reading the news or watching the news is overwhelming, try to keep it to like, because you want to stay informed, but try to keep it to a particular portion in the day, rather than, you know, doing that at, you know, intervals throughout the day. That's a really good one. And the, the uh, it, you're right, because I mean, there is so much out there, there's so much noise coming at us, whether it's on social media, whether it's on in the news, and even from the people around us, like everybody has their views and opinions, and you're trying to figure out where do you look at and that what is it that you're trying to, you know, understand for yourself and find your own comfort, you know, and, you know, I think that, you know, listening to you today, what became really clear is that, you know, we sometimes have to get comfortable with discomfort. You know, and that's a really important part of the resiliency, right, for ourselves. And how do we cope, you know, when we don't have control of everything? How do we manage? You know, and I think you, you, you stated that so well. Um, you know, and there, the other last, final last question that we have, um, you know, it, it, do we really think that, you know, um, there's an end here? you know, that we are going to be able mentally that we will have a good recovery at the end of this pandemic is one of the final questions. You know, that one is is up for debate. I think that's one of those uh, tolerating uncertainty moments because yeah. I think we, we don't have enough information. I would suspect that, you know, this experience will certainly have affected the way we think about things and the way we behave to some extent. But I think as we see with a lot of things, we are also good at adapting. And eventually, I think as things change, we should be, there may be differences, but I think a lot of us will be able to sort of get back into sort of the same headspace that we were before. And as a lot of these stressors alleviate, I also think we'll see a lot of that anxiety and that and that depression also start to to alleviate. Well, thank you for that. And thank you. So much for a very informative and very engaging presentation. Uh, we really appreciate your time today. So, um, you know, I also would like at this point to thank our partners that were involved with us here. You know, we had with Bell um, and Bell Let's Talk, you know, being a, a key host and partner for this, as well as CN. We can't thank them enough to allow these events to happen because this is an area that is so important to everybody. And we know that everybody, as you said, has mental health. And, you know, it's something that we all need to know about and be aware of, you know, and I think that you were able to, like I said earlier, um, provide us with some tools for our toolbox, you know, so thank you so much for that. And I think the other thing that I look at on this, you know, that I remind people when I'm out there, because um, I actually do, I sit on the board of uh, Canadian Mental Health Association, Halton, and we have a lot of conversations about, you know, having people reach out for help, but equally as important as having, is leaning in or reaching in for people, because not everybody is able to do that, you know, and to make sure we're asking, as you said, people, how are you doing today? you know, and just, and really listening to those conversations. So I think it's really important that we do those things, you know, and um, like I said, can't, uh, you know, thank you enough. Um, for everybody who's attended, you know, on the, in the audience, thank you so much uh, for being part of this, uh, for your support as chamber members or as guests, you know, allow us to have a healthy chamber community. We have, allow us to advocate on behalf of businesses and promote economic growth for our community. And also to make sure we have a high quality of life for everybody living in our community. So thank you so so much and you know there's going to be put some information on for our local resources in terms of mental health in our community um, but remember we have the reach out center for kids for uh, kids under 18 we have cmha halton uh, we have support has an adapt and we also have our distress lines in addition to kids health line and the canadian distress line so please use those if you feel there's a need reach out for help and as i said feel free to reach into your friends if you're starting to wonder if they're okay 
Well, thank you very much. And I hope you all have a great day.